Next up, we have Karina. So Karina is also looking at the perception of lexical tones, but her study is like more focused on like phonetic training. So yeah, hello, I'm Karina and I'm originally from Peru. So despite my appearances, Chinese is not my native language and actually native speaker is Spanish, but I'm also interested in the Chinese language and in particular, um, my project focuses on Mandarin lexical tones. And this is also a project based on speech perception and is linked to second language acquisition. So um, as part of my project, I will be covering also the role of musical experience in the perception of Mandarin lexical tones, but I'll put a focus on two type of training methodologies, which is the high variability and low variability phonetic training. So my talk breakdown is similar to that of an experimental paper. So I go through the introduction, method, results and discussion and conclusion. So first of all, um, it has been well established that second language learners find it difficult to perceive um, non-native phonetic contrast, and that is contrast that they do not have in the native language. Um, however, the ability to discriminate contrast can be improved through auditory training, phonetic training, as has been shown by various studies. And um, moving on, I want to ask you guys if you have an idea of what would be the difference between high variability and low variability phonetic training. Does anyone want to have a guess? So basically, the difference has to do with variability in terms of uh, training stimuli that is used to for training. Um, and I'll explain further on now. Okay, so. High reliability for network training um, has been introduced by Logan and colleagues in 1991. And this was a very influential study. And what they did is train native Japanese listeners to discriminate the English phonetic contrast between R and L, um, so the alveolar sounds, um, given that Japanese speakers do not really have the L in their phonemic inventory. So what it did was they included variability in the training stimuli in terms of two things, phonetic context and also in terms of talker variability. So phonetic context refers to the environment in which the target speech sounds occur. So in this case, R and L would be presented in different environments, such as word initial position or or final position, right? And then we also have variability in terms of talker, which means the stimuli they use was produced by multiple speakers. And what they did was test effectiveness of the training procedure um, using a pre-test and post-test design with the training um, phase in between the two, uh, using a forced choice identification task. And what they found was that participants improve on the performance after doing the training. So they improved significantly in the post-test. And they also found that participants were able to successfully generalize to novel stimuli after training. So they did a separate task after training using novel stimuli, which they haven't been presented during the test phase. And based on these results, the authors interpreted the findings as evidence that Stimulus variability benefits categorical perceptions of non-native contrasts. And crucially, uh, Logan and colleagues argue that high variability in the training material helps listeners form robust phonetic categories for second language contrast. So the idea is that given exposure to the wide range of acoustic cues, which comes from both the diverse phonetic context and also idiosyncratic talker specific differences because they involve multiple speakers. I believe there was like two male speakers and four female speakers in the, in the study. Um, basically, this variability um, in the speech signal helps listeners tune in to the acoustic phonetic cues that are relevant to the contrast in question, which leads to better categorical perception. This argument was also based on a comparison with an earlier study, also based on the same contrast. And this was a study from Strange and Dittman in 1984. Um, the only difference was that they used a low variability paradigm in which the stimuli 
was only produced by single talker and there was no variability in terms of phonetic environment. I believe they only used uh, the contrast in what in a show position. And importantly, Strange and Dittman did not find any discrimination improvement after training. Um, based on these studies, uh, my study is intended to further investigate whether the variability benefit uh, that has been observed on segmental speech perception can be extended to suprasegmental domain, which is why I'm focusing on Mandarin lexical tones. And I also aim to examine whether musical experience plays a role in the perception of lexical tones. And I have predicted that there will be a high variability for phonetic training benefit and that musicians will outperform the musicians. And so what the, uh, moving on to the method then, um, in terms of participants, I recruited 33 native English speakers with no previous experience of Mandarin Chinese uh, or any other tonal languages. And yeah, I did this through Facebook and also prolific. And the experiment was also run online uh, through Gorilla Experiment Builder. And I asked participants to wear headphones to complete the training. So I used 44 Mandarin monosyllabic root words. Um, so this is based on 11 syllables, each produced with the four Mandarin tones. So that yields the 44 words. And I had them recorded by five different native Mandarin speakers. In terms of procedure, um, we have five stages, of which the main ones would be the pre-test, the training, and the post-test. I'll go through each of these ones individually. So first, we've got the exposure phase, which is basically me introducing participants to Mandarin tones because they had no prior experience with them, and so they were explicitly told that uh, Mandarin is a tonal language that uses four tones to distinguish words, word meanings. And then they proceeded to what well, is the pretest to test their initial ability on tone discrimination. And I used 36 trials in total. And in each trial, participants had to listen to a series of three words, uh, two of which had the same tone, which is why. Um, Dong and colleagues call it a free interval oddity task. And what they have to do is spot the odd one out. So which of the three uh, words had a different tone? But basically, you get the idea. We had like, um, three different words. Uh, imagine the two first ones in, with the first tone and the final one um, with fourth tone. And they would have to choose the third one because it had a different tone. Um, yeah. And then they proceeded to the training and I used an identification task. Um, and then the training was the um, most important part of the experiment because participants were randomly assigned to two different training conditions, one of which was the high variability training condition and the other one was the low variability training condition. The only difference being that the stimuli from the low variability condition involve a single talker and then the high variability condition contains stimuli produced by four different talkers. Uh, in total, they completed 88 trials. That is two repetitions of the 44 words I had. Moving on, um, they then were asked to complete a self-report questionnaire where they had to detail the languages they spoke, um, the estimated ability in each language, and also whether or not they play any instruments musical instruments. Um, yeah, and the questionnaire was placed before the post-test in order to give them a break from the perceptual tasks. And also to um, classify uh, whether or not musicians were, um, participants were musicians or non-musicians. Um, finally, they did a post-test, which is identical to that of the pre-test. Again, a category discrimination task or free interval oddity task. Uh, moving on to the results, uh, if you can see in this box plot, um, you can see the two training conditions, LB for low variability and HB for high variability. And this is also, this is only a measure of the percentage of improvement. So 
this considers the difference between the performance and uh, in the post test compared to the pretest. And you can see that uh, the improvement range from um, the low variability group range from approximately, I guess, minus eight to 22%. And the high variability group, um, I guess they had a slightly wider improvement range from minus 17 to 19. But uh, in general, the low variability subjects improve more than high variability ones, as you can see from the median. Um, in the low variability group, which is about 6%, whereas the median for the high variability group is um, about 1%. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but I'll talk you through it. Um, yeah, so these results suggest that at least for short-term training, there was no advantage of high variability phonetic training um, over low variability phonetic training. Brilliant. Um, Next, um, I also consider results in terms of musical experience. And again, we have a box plot of divided into the two training conditions, but this time grouped by musicians and non-musicians. Mm, yeah, as you can see, the general pattern would be that overall non-musicians outperform musicians. So you can see, for example, in the low variability group, um, non musicians perform moderately higher, improve higher than musicians, except for this one participant who is an outlier and um, actually improved by about 22%. And in terms of the high variability condition, there was a somewhat wider improvement range for non musicians, as you can see, uh, than musicians over here in the red bar. So the summary of the results would be um, that um, contrary to our initial predictions, right, that there will be a benefit of high variability phonetic training and that musicians will outperform the musicians, there was actually no overall benefit of high variability training. Uh, rather, participants seem to benefit more from the low variability condition. And there was also no clear difference in tone perception ability. There seemed to be no effect of musicianship because it seemed that non-musicians were equally as good or even better than musicians. So what could explain these results? So the lack of a um, high variability phonetic training benefit could be due to many factors. One of them may be due to individual aptitude differences. So individual aptitude may determine the extent to which a listener benefits from input variability. Uh, it may be the case that uh, low variability training could be sufficient for learning to discriminate non-native contrast. And this links to the point of um, the fact that my phonetic contrast were suprasegmental ones. I was dealing with tone, um, whereas previous studies um, using the high variability phonetic training paradigm was based on segmental contrast, so consonantal contrast. And so it may be the case that, you know, high variability uh, training may not be as effective for training suprasegmental contrast as it is for training segmental contrast. It could also be due to the fact that I use a single training block, a single training session. So this is why my project uh, was titled Short Term um, Phonetic Training in the sense that most common phonetic training studies are typically um, longer, so they involve multiple training blocks and um, they also run over a period of, we're talking about two or three weeks and each session involves around 40 minutes at least of training, whereas my experiment as a whole only lasted 20 minutes. And yeah, other methodological reasons to consider or factors would be that obviously my experiment was run online um, it was not done in a laboratory setting and um, the short nature of my study means that perhaps um, I didn't allow sufficient time for participants to build the mental representations for the tonal categories in their mind, in their minds. And, yeah. and as for why we couldn't see a, that musicians perform better than musicians, could be explained by different 
reasons. One of them as well might be the intrinsic differences in musical ability. So um, individuals with no musical experience can perform equally as well as musicians in lexical tone perception, perhaps. And maybe um, my musicianship criteria was uh, could be improved because um, participants obviously uh, responded to a self-report questionnaire in which they were classified as musicians or no musicians based on the fact of whether or not they play any instruments or they had ever sung in a choir. Uh, because I had a very loose concept of musicianship, um, this, is, this has the limitation of losing information or setting a kind of point where I assign people as categorize them as musicians of non-musicians uh, while excluding relevant information about their musical training experience. So what that means is that I did not differentiate between subjects who had, had, who had received formal training experience, musical training experience, or those who received little to no musical training. So I couldn't account for differences in musical ability, uh, which is why it may be worth considering other tools for classifying people. So for instance, um, the Goldsmith Musical Sophistication Index, which Nina used for her project, uh, because it seems that um, seems to be a more comprehensive questionnaire that takes into account musical experience. But um, we would have to rerun my experiment using this new tool to view new results. So yeah, uh, to conclude, uh, yeah, again, I. This study aimed to examine um, two questions. Um, the main one was whether or not there was an overall benefit of uh, high variability or stimulus variability. And then um, we also saw whether or not musical experience plays a role in the perception of tonal contrast. And our results were totally opposite from those of our initial predictions. So it also seems that the results suggested that musical experience is not the sole predictor of tone discrimination ability. And I guess in light of these findings, it is worth making methodological adjustments and rerun the experiment to obtain um, more reliable results. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I guess the present study contributes to the growing body of research on lexical tone perception. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you.